So good morning. Happy, um, happy three day week. Happy Thanksgiving week. I need to talk to one of the things about Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving week is that you have um, there's the wonderful thing about um, a turkey high five. So if you don't know how a turkey high five goes, you know, normally on a high five, you have you and your friend and it's like, hey, high five like that. And it's like, cool. like that. Okay. So on a tur on Thanksgiving week, you get to do a turkey high five. And so one person keeps their hand open and then the other person can take and make a thumb. Okay. Thumbs up. They go like that. And you have a turkey. See the head and the feathers. And you go, blah, 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 blah. So when you give somebody a high five this week, you can be like, hey, high five. But instead of regular high five, when they go to give you a high five, you can make a fist. Yep, turkey. So there you go. There's turkey high fives. If we were at school, we would practice that. You can um, you can entertain your family with that one over the, the next several days. Um, this week, we're moving on to start talking about momentum and impulse. So it continues with our idea of forces, and you'll see force in what we're doing with this. Um, but it, you know, last week we had, we were working on and dealing with the scientific notation and large numbers. Here's the thing. Let me clarify something on this. Normally when we're doing the stuff that we're doing for um, scientific notation calculations, I'm going around the room and helping people with their calculators. I get that that's not something that is practiced often, and so it might be more difficult for you. And so normally, when we're in school, as people are working, I'm helping people figure out their individual calculator. I get that it is not a possibility for me to do that while we're on distance learning. So here's the deal. If you show all of your steps appropriately, you show your equation, you show how you're putting things in, and your calculation, your calculator calculation is wrong, but everything else is right, you'll still receive full credit on that. I'm not gonna pull off stuff because we didn't have an opportunity to really fix that well. Um, I did pop up another video that's on there. Uh, it, Schoology was being goofy on Friday for me, so I wasn't able to get it up there. But I, it is up there now, so if you do wanna go back and work on yours, what it does is it has um, iPad, phone, scientific calculator and graphing calculator, four different ways that you would set up various problems in there. And so if that's your situation and calculating is a hard time, go on there, find what you have. And I put like a, it's a little like header on the bottom that will tell you what one it's on. So you can sort of fast forward and find what you need. But take a look at that, um, follow through exactly step-by-step. Step. If you're not, if you're using the E, you're not using a times 10 at all in that. That takes care of that, that E communicates that to the, cal to the calculator. So that's up there, but please know if you're showing all of your stuff on there, if you show all of your steps appropriately, that then you have the, and you do all of that. If your calculation was off in the calculator, you'll still receive full credit on that. So if you haven't taken your quiz yet, please do that and get that wrapped up. Um, second thing is, um, it. I was debating about moving stuff over to YouTube anyways, and then a couple people noticed or mentioned that it loads better on your iPads if I do that. So move, the videos that I have have now been, everything is from here on out will be hosted on YouTube. And so it'll be easier, hopefully be easier for you to get this, to get the videos. And so if that's, if you've just sort of given up on getting the videos because it's not working real well, um, know that that has been switched and you can take a look at that and hopefully that will be helpful for what we're doing moving forward. All right, those are my main, my main announcements for today. Um, be moving forward, be keeping up in, in this quarter. This quarter has some nice breaks that can section off like Keep up for two weeks, keep up for three weeks, keep up for four weeks, and then all of a sudden the quarter's over. So do what you need to do to keep moving forward and do the pieces that you need to. Um, so if that means if you haven't finished up on your practice problems and your lab from practice problems lab or quiz from last week, please get that taken care of. And then this week you'll have a set of practice problems. It's not very long. And we're going to set up three of them in class today. You'll have a lab, and the lab doesn't involve calculations. And then next week, but you won't have a quiz this week. Next week, we'll add on another concept with practice problems as well in a different lab. So, and then you will have a quiz on all of it. It all goes together anyways. 
but it'll all the quiz will be next week. So don't sit there and think, oh, well, all this isn't due till next Thursday. I should probably just do it next Thursday. It's going to be a lot to do then. So do the stuff you have this week. And then when you do this stuff for next week and take the quiz, you'll be in good shape. I'll talk about all that as we get going. So our work for today, our, our work for this week is on momentum and on impulse. And one thing, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you. One thing that happens is that I've, I'm, I'm putting in each week, I put in a summary, a written summary of what we've done. And so if you go to Schoology and if you go to your um, week two, quarter two, week two, momentum, impulse, and Newton's laws, and if you go in your videos and summaries, you have one that says Fizz, Momentum, and Impulse Summary. So I already opened that here. And when you open it up, it just has a, it has kind of typed out what we're talking about. And so sometimes um, if you've watched the video already and you just need a quick look at something, this might be an easier way to take a look at it. Um, sometimes looking at this before the videos can be helpful. And sometimes this is more helpful than the videos, depending on how you learn and depending on what works for you. And so I'm going to use this a little bit, A, to, to kind of show you what it is, and then B, to talk through some of the pieces that we're doing this week. So the first thing we want to keep in mind is the idea of Newton's laws of motion. And Newton, Isaac Newton, had three laws of motion, and these were based on observation and what he saw. Because you know, if I were to take and set down, you know, just like set down a pen or something, and it started floating, you'd be like, no, 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 that is not right. Because we know that. We know that that would not be right. And so there's things that we know, but he took and he did some research on exactly what's happening with those things and how it works. So these three laws of, of motion are this. First of all, the law of inertia. And the law of inertia says that objects at motion stay in motion, objects at rest stay in rest, unless acted upon by an outside force. Essentially, an object wants to keep doing what it's already doing. So if it is sitting there, it's not magically just going to start levitating or magically going to start moving around. There has to be a force present in order for that to happen. If it's moving forward, it wants to keep moving forward as long as there's no other force acting on it. So in space, if I take and I throw a baseball in space and there aren't any other forces around that are going to be able to impact that ball, that ball is going to go on forever and ever and ever. Now, if we have something rolling, there is friction on the ground. So that is an outside force and it would eventually stop it. You see that in a reduced form if you're sliding a hockey puck across the ice. You don't have as much friction and it can slide much farther. Or if you play air hockey and there's that, that layer of air between the air hockey puck and the table, even less friction. And so that would go on forever and ever and ever, assuming no friction. So law of inertia, objects in motion stay in motion. Objects at rest stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. And what we're talking about today with momentum and impulse is mostly focusing on the idea of um, the first law. The second law we have used quite a bit because we've done these calculations, but it's F equals MA. The net force on an object is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And we spent quite a bit of time working on F equals MA a couple of weeks ago. And the third law is action-reaction. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So if I punch a table, it's going to, the force with, with which I hit the table, that table is going to hit back just as hard. So I, if you've ever, any, anyone ever accidentally get upset and punch a wall? And there's kind of two situations. You either punch the wall and you go through it, or you punch the wall and break your hand if you hit a stud or something. Either way, action-reaction. So those are the three laws, and we'll do some more work with those in a couple of weeks. First law about inertia and an object wanting to stay in motion um, is what we're focusing on when we talk about momentum. So we have the three laws that are here. Now, I want to kind of go over here for a minute. Okay, inertia. If it has mass, it has inertia. We'll say more mass equals more inertia. And so for inertia, it's just an object's tendency to keep doing what it is already doing. So if it's sitting there and not moving at all, it still has inertia. 
It just doesn't want to move. It doesn't want to change what's already happening. Think about that. You get up in the morning, nice and comfy and asleep. You definitely have a lot of inertia. You don't want to move. Maybe you do. Maybe you're a, an early riser and an up and get them. I struggle with that. Um, so more mass, everything with mass has some amount of inertia. And the more mass you have, the more inertia you have. Inertia is not dependent on motion. Momentum, however, is essentially a measurement. It's a, it's a calculation, a measurement of moving inertia. So we'll say that. Measurement of moving inertia. It has to be moving to have momentum. Inertia itself does not need to be moving. So I could have a giant rock in my yard. It is just sitting there. It has a lot of inertia. It has a lot of mass, so it would have a lot of inertia. But it would have zero momentum because it's not moving. On the flip side, I could take a little rock and I could throw it. It's not going to have much mass, so it won't have as much inertia, but it would have more momentum because it's moving. So inertia, anything with mass has inertia, but momentum, that mass has to be moving in order to have momentum. So how does this look? Well, we have an equation to do this. Inertia is just no like, hey, Whichever has more mass has more inertia. There's a direct relationship there. Inertia doesn't have a unit. It's just a concept. It's saying like, okay, more mass, more inertia. It's not going to change what it's doing very easily. Momentum, however, is a combination of how big it is and how fast it's moving. Think about it. If you have something that is, you know, let's say, I don't know, let's say a semi truck started slowly rolling. You're not going to stop that really easily. Even though it's going slow, it has a ton of mass. So to actually stop it is going to take a lot of force because even though it's moving slow, a whole lot of mass would give it a whole lot of momentum. On the flip side, if you have something that's teeny, teeny, tiny and going really, really fast, you're not going to stop that very easily either. Easy, ugh, easily either. So it's that combination between the mass and the velocity that gives us our momentum. In fact, this is what it looks like. We have momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Now, here's the deal. Mass we know is m. Velocity we know is v. We can't just use m for momentum because it's, we have it for mass. So somewhere in the Latin, Greek, I'm not sure at what point, the word for momentum started with a P. There's no P in here anymore, but our variable stays as a P. <laughs> I know that makes no sense. I know it's super goofy, something you just have to commit to your, to your, to your mind. Um, it's not even like pneumonia where it's a silent P, but it's there. There's just not a P. It's an invisible P. Here we have P equals MV. Momentum is represented by a P, mass, velocity. Momentum has the units of kilograms times meters per second. And it's not like with Newtons, we said, oh, kilograms times meters per second squared equals a Newton. This isn't like that. With this, we're saying kilograms times meters per second, and we just leave it as that. Mass is measured in kilograms. Velocity is measured in meters per second. If you're given a mass in grams, you will need to get it into kilograms to make that calculation. So units for momentum look like this. Mass and meter, mass looks like this. Velocity looks like this. These haven't changed, but that one is a new one. So we have inertia. Inertia, everything with mass has inertia. Momentum anything that has mass and is moving has momentum. If either one of those goes up, momentum goes up. So the bigger the mass, more momentum. Faster it is, more momentum. Both of those pieces play into it. So if you want to screenshot that, you can. I'll erase that in just a moment. Any questions on this so far? Um, I got like kicked out and I just came back in. Uh, did you just, is this the only thing like you did? So far, yep. 
So if you want to screenshot it, I'm about to erase it. Oh, yeah. And for out of the question, I started the practice problems. And uh, for, I think it's number seven and eight, um, I was confused which formula to yep, use. Yep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go over three, seven, and eight as part of class today. Okay. So we'll do that in a little bit. All right, so we have this. We're going to take this. I'm going to erase it. All right. So how would this look? So let's say I brought some cars down here. We have lots of cars at my house. We got an ambulance. Ambulance is kind of big. And let's do a little race car here. Ambulance and a race car. Now, inertia, if we talk about just inertia, ambulance has more mass, so it would have more inertia. So if it's just sitting there talking about inertia, or if they're going the exact same speed, Ambulance has more mass, so it would have more inertia. It just has more stuff that you would have to get moving or changing in order to change what you're doing. If they're moving, let's say the ambulance is moving at, um, let's say the ambulance happens to be moving slow, and the race car were to be moving fast. Well, you could actually have the same amount of momentum here. Because if this mass is big, but the velocity is slow, and if this velocity is fast, but the mass is smaller, they could equal out to be what they are, or to be the same. So depending on what you have will depend on kind of that combination of what you'll have here. Now, that's what we're talking about when we're just talking about momentum, just how much, how fast it's going and how, and how big it is. Essentially, inertia, or sorry, forces get a, an object moving. Forces make something accelerate to have it start moving. Momentum, once your forces are done, momentum keeps it in motion. Let me, let me talk about this. So, um, so there was one time, a long time ago, that I was playing in a softball league. And softball, we were out there, we... Uh, we, we were out playing, and you could see a storm rolling in. Well, it was the last game of the season. It was playoffs, and we ended up winning. So we won the, the league championship. Wahoo, yay us. So we went, out to, um, we went out to Red Robin afterward. If you've ever been to Red Robin, you get free bottomless fries. And if you get a rip your float, that's bottomless as well. So we were at Red Robin and hanging out and having our burgers and our fries and rip your floats and whatever. And so then as we went to leave, that storm had rolled in. And so as I had gotten out of my car, it was dry out and I parked my car and I got out and I was walking across, um, walking across the, the like grass pebble area, you know, where they have like rocks and trees and stuff, walked across that rest of the parking lot, went into the restaurant. We had our burgers and our bottomless fries and our bottomless root beer. And we went back out and it was pouring down rain, like pouring 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 down rain so we're all kind of standing there we're like all right good job high fives high fives good job we won the championship yay us and i look at my car and i'm like gotta get out there and i didn't really want to get very wet and so i was like well i'll just run fast so i look and i take off i'm running i'm running, running, running. and i go to step and i go to walk through that or run through that kind of grassy pebble area and as i do that I like get a little bit of water on my foot and I'm like, oh no. And my next step, apparently it's like a drain system and it went down really far. So I stepped into about this much water. Objects at rest stay at rest. Objects in motion stay in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So this much water created a really fast outside force on the bottom of my leg. It did not create an outside force on the top of my body. That kept on going straight into the water, completely soaked every ounce of me. It was ridiculous. It was real funny. And so I look up. I finally, like, realize what happened. And I look up. I look around. And I'm like, nobody even saw it. Like, if that's going to happen, someone at least has to get a good kick out of it. And I look over. My friend's car is shaking. She's in there laughing so hard because 
somebody did see it. Um, but that's what happens with with Newton's law. If you ever trip or fall, it's Newton's law's fault. It is Isaac Newton's fault. You can say that. If you play a sport, you try and use Newton's laws against the other person and in your own benefit. So if you're playing basketball and you make a quick cut, you're hoping that the other person has enough momentum going that way so you can go that way and get around them. In fact, you try and set them up in order for that to happen. So we have this other thing that goes along with momentum and it's called impulse. And it's how you end up stopping and the amount of force that happens on that. So let's go back to the big car. And now we're just gonna use this car. Just use the ambulance here. Now, let's say you have a car that's driving. And use, and there is a stop sign up here. You can go back to that like crazy friend driver. Okay, S-T-O-P, can't really see it. Okay, you have a stop sign there. And there's a couple of situations. Now the ambulance, can't, now we don't need an ambulance here. We're gonna use a regular car. Do a van. We have lots of cars here. Do a van. Now the van can drive up and make a nice slow stop and come to a stop. Or the van can be driving, 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 and all of a sudden, uh, make a stop. Either way, you have a change in momentum. And so you have your change in momentum. We call that an impulse. So any change in momentum is your impulse. You're going from fast to slow, or you're going from slow to fast. Either way, that is your impulse. Doesn't matter how quickly or slowly you do that, that is your impulse. However, how quickly or slowly you do that will change how much force is required. So if you're driving, 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 and you make a really fast stop, you have a short time, so you have a big force to do that. You slam on the brakes. Or if you're driving, 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 and you see, oh, there's a stop sign over there. And you take your foot off the gas, put it on the brake, and come to a slow stop, it uses less force, but more time. The impulse, the change in momentum is the same, but the force needed to make that change in momentum is not the same. So we have this. We're gonna say that our change in momentum, we say delta P, this is what represents impulse, is our change in momentum, is equal to the force times the time. So if you have a big force, you can change that momentum in a small time. If you have a little force, you can change that momentum. It just takes more time to do that. Another way that we'll write this is this, that MVF, sorry, minus MVI, equals force times time. This gives us our change in momentum. We take our final velocity minus our initial velocity. Our change in momentum comes from us changing our velocity. So it might be because we're getting faster, it might be because we're getting slower, but either way that's going to require a force for a given amount of time. Big force, small time. Big time, you can have a smaller force. So it can look like this. If we sometimes people say, well, delta P equals, and we say big F times little t. If we have a big force, we have a small time. Or we can have delta P, they can be the same change in momentum. And we can have a little force times a big time. Either way, if the force goes up, time goes down. Force goes down, time goes up. Somewhere in the middle, they're both somewhere in the middle. Again, difference in your driving, if you have a big force, you slam on the brakes, you can, you can do that in a small time. You drive a really fast car, like a, with a real powerful engine, and you hit the gas, you have a big force on that car. It takes off in a short time. However, if you have a car that doesn't go that fast, you, might, you can get up to speed. I can get up to speed, but it'll take longer to do that. I was driving next to a little tiny, like, little Tesla the other day. I was just impressed. I was like, ooh, that is fast. Okay, Tesla had a huge force, a short time. Pew! 
we are in downtown St. Paul. It's not like they were going anywhere real far, real fast, but come on, if you're driving that, sure. Um, my car, not a Tesla. I had force. It just took me longer to do that. So we have momentum on its own, and then we have impulse. Most of the time you'll use, you'll have to figure out what's going on here to get your force and your time. And so I want to do an example of that problem. And then I want to take some time looking at, I want to do an example of this. I want to do, and I want to talk about your lab for this week. And then I want to do, set you up to do well on some of those practice problems that are a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to erase this. If you want to take a screenshot, do that, please. All right. And again, some of this stuff will show up if you go back into this. Um, there's some examples here. There's the triangle method, if you like that. It goes through the details of this a little bit more, and it goes with a couple of examples here. So I'll do some examples that are a little bit different from that. So you see it a couple of different times in a couple of different ways. So we're going to do kind of two parts to this. We're going to have a car. So I'll say... I don't know, we'll say a thousand kilogram car speeds up to 25 meters per second. Thousand kilogram car, regular car, speeds up to 25 meters per second. Regular speed, nothing fancy. We'll say from rest. So we have that set up. Now let's say they do it quickly. We'll say that the time equals, I don't know, six seconds. So we can say, and then we'll do it slowly. We'll say slowly. Say time equals 20 seconds. This is real slow. That's okay. So we have this setup. So we know that our mass equals 1,000 kilograms. We know our VI equals zero, VF equals 25 meters per second. And in this one, T equals six seconds. So we know that our change in, our change in momentum is equal to our force times our time. We wanna know how much force is needed. Well, we'll say MVF minus MVI equals force times time. And if we're solving for force, we just need to divide by the time. So we have force equals MVF minus MVI over T. Well, MVF is 1,000 kilograms times 25 meters per second. MVI, it was starting at rest. So VI is zero. So zero times anything is zero. So we have minus zero divided by our time here of six seconds. So if we take this and calculate it, we say 1,000 times 25 gives us 25,000 divided by six gives us 4,166.7 newtons. So in order for that car to speed up over six seconds from zero to 25 meters per second, it takes this force here, 41.667, or sorry, 4,100, 4, 66.7 newtons. Now, same car getting up to speed over 20 seconds. So we have same variables, except this time time equals 20 seconds. So we can say MVF minus MVI, same rearrangement divided by T gives us our force. So we'll say 1,000 kilograms times 25 meters per second minus zero. Same setup to start. This time we're doing that over 20 seconds. So we can take 25,000 divided by 20 seconds and we get 1,250 newtons. So considerably less force when the time goes down. Short time, larger force. Six seconds, we have 44,166.7 newtons. 
same change in momentum, this time over 20 seconds, and we have 1,250 newtons. So as the time goes, goes up, the force goes down. I'll leave this on here. Any questions on this one? All right. Let's talk. Uh, I'll do, we'll talk about your lab stuff last. There are three problems I would like to set up for what you're doing in your practice problems. For the most, you don't have too many. I think there's eight problems. For the most part, they're pretty straightforward. Number three is a little bit goofy. So I'm going to talk about number three first. I'm going to talk about three, seven, and eight. And then if there are other questions, I'll take those afterward if we have time. So in number three, it says, it's talking about a sled situation. And it says that the velocity is 15 meters per second. That's a pretty good sled speed. That's fun. That'd be fun. The momentum that is there is 1,250 kilogram meters per second. And then it says it gives you a mass, but it's also having you find the mass. So we're going to find the mass with these things. And then once we find the mass, this is the total mass. Total mass is what we'll calculate here. But then it talks about that the mass of the sled is 3.53 kilograms. So the sled mass and it's asking you to solve for the mass of the kid that's on the sled. So the total mass equals kid plus sled. That will give you the total momentum in there when, when figured out with these other variables. But you don't know the mass of the kid. You only know the mass of the sled. So you can use your velocity and your total momentum to solve for that mass. So you can say P equals MV. Oh, did you just start number three? Yep. Okay. Um, one second. My note. I kept getting kicked out. Oh, okay. Um, so P equals MV here. And we're going to solve for the mass. And so we'll divide both sides by V. So we'll have mass equals P over V. I know there's a mass here, but that's not the total mass. That's only part of it. So we need to know what the total mass is, and this will give us the total mass. So we can say our momentum of 1, 2, 5, 0 kilogram meters per second divided by our velocity of 15 meters per second. And when we do that, we get that our total mass is 83.3 repeating. So we can just round that 83.3 kilograms. Now that total mass is the kid plus the sled. So that will equal kid plus 3.53 kilograms. So to get the mass of the kid, You'll subtract the 3.53 kilograms from both sides and cancels out here and we'll have the mass of the kid remaining. So when you subtract those out, you'll end up with the mass of the kid. I think it's what, 79.8 or something? Yeah, 79.8 kilograms. So sometimes you have, it looks like you have all the pieces, but you only have part of one. So you can solve for the one that you have the part of there and then use that part to figure out the other part. And that's what they're looking at in number three. So I'll leave that there if you want to screenshot it. Any questions on that one? All right, I'm going to take a look at number seven then. I'm going to erase this. All right, number seven um, is a little bit goofy because you're trying to solve for VF. So it gives you this situation. This is number seven. Um, it says that the mass 
is 11.25 kilograms. If you haven't started yet, that's totally fine, but make sure you're getting this. So when you get there, you can look at it and figure out what you need to on it. It says that it is going at 22 meters per second. And it says that there's a force slowing it down. And so of two, two, two zero, zero Newtons. Now here's the deal. Because it's slowing it down, we have to make that force negative. And so the, the magnitude is given in the problem, but the situation of it slowing down indicates that you have to have a negative sign in that situation because it's going against the motion, making it slow down. It does that over a time of 4.5 seconds. And we need to solve for VF. And it says, hint, that VF does not equal zero. So we can set this up with this equation, MVF minus MVI equals force times time. We have the force, we have the time, we have the mass and the VI. For the sake of kind of being able to work it out a little bit easier, I'm going to pull the mass out because mass is being multiplied by both of these, I can write this as M times VF minus VI, because if I were to distribute it here and there, it would turn out to that. So equals force times time. Then I can take and divide both sides by the mass. So I have VF minus VI equals force times time over the mass. I'm working to solve for the VF. So I'm going to add VI to both sides. Cancels out there and I'm left with this, that VF is equal to force times time over mass. And I'll take that whole number and add VI to it. So now that we have this, we can put some numbers in here. We can say VF equals force times time over mass plus VI. And so our force is negative 2200 newtons. The time that we have is 4.5 seconds. And we'll divide by the mass that we have of 11.25 kilograms. And then from there, we'll get that answer and we'll add our VI of 22 meters per second. We have to calculate this first and then add the VI. So when we calculate that out, this gives us um, negative 8.8 .8 meters per second plus 22 meters per second. Remember, we've got the negative here. So that's where that negative comes from. So when we get that in the end, the VF is equal to 13.2 meters per second. So there's two things to keep in mind here. Screenshot this if you need to. Um, two things to keep in mind here. One of the things to keep in mind is that because it indicates that it is slowing down, that that force has to have a negative sign numerically on there. And frequently when it is written in a problem like that, it'll be set up something similar to that. It'll say it is slowing down with a force of whatever the force is, in this case, 2,200 newtons. But uh, where, do you, where yep. did you get 22 from? The 22 meters per second from our VI. Mm -hmm. uh, you just added that at the end. And then, where did you get equal negative 8.8? Where did that come from? When you calculate this, yeah, it equals negative 8. Okay. Yeah. So, when you have that, um, getting this part in there is the part to remember, and then rearranging it appropriately from there is kind of the sticking point on some, some of it. So that's number seven. If you haven't had a chance to screenshot, please do that. And then I'm going to set up number eight for you as well. All right, I'm going to take this down. 
All right, number eight. So number eight is a Superman problem. I like superheroes. Um, mass is equal to 105 kilograms. It's going to be our good estimate for Superman here. Superman starts with an initial velocity of zero meters per second and comes to a final velocity of 55 meters per second, so really fast. And that uses a force of 2,500 newtons. And so there's two parts to this question. First of all, figuring out how fast he was able to make that transition from zero to 55 meters per second, so that's well over 100 miles an hour. And then secondly, is to figure out um, how far of a distance he traveled during that. So there's two parts to what we're doing. The first one is using momentum. We have MVF minus MVI equals force times time. And so we're going to solve for time. So I'm going to divide both sides by the force. So I have the time equals MVF minus MVI over the force. And we can put our numbers in here. MVF is... Uh, 105 kilograms times 55 meters per second minus zero because zero times anything gives us zero. And then we'll divide by the force, 2,500 newtons. So we'll take 105 times 55, taking away zero, and then divide by 2,500 newtons. And that gives us a teeny tiny time of 2.31 seconds. That's a huge acceleration. We go from zero to 55 meters per second in 2.31 seconds. That's the first part of it. Now, the second part is a big four part. So we know that our VI equals zero meters per second. We know that our VF equals 55 meters per second. We know our time is equal to 2.31 seconds, and it asks for the distance. Well, if we look at our big four equations, Equation number two has V, I, V, F, T, and D in it. And we can use the equation D equals V, F plus V, I over two times T. And so from there, then using the same information and the time that you got, you can plug that in and finish that one up. The rest of them are pretty straightforward. Are there any questions on those before I go on and talk about the lab for this week? So let's talk, let me be done presenting. Lab for this week is this. You need to, normally we would have, we would do this at school and we would take, we would take a day. I would go buy a whole bunch of eggs um, and you would bring in supplies to do your egg drop and whatever you would think would work best to drop that egg off the link and have it not break with the smallest amount of stuff. Sure, I could bring two pillows, put it in the middle, duct tape it around it, toss it over. Of course, it's not going to break. No, but that's not what we're going for. You want to be able to make it not break by using the least amount of stuff. Now, there's a few things that have to happen with this. First of all, it does have to fall onto the cement. You can't like put all kinds of stuff, you know, drag a mattress out, set it down, drop it down. It didn't break. Cool. So it has to be in the packaging of what you have. Parachutes are fine if you want. The biggest thing in doing this is that you are reducing the force by increasing the time. That's why airbags work. If you're in a car and you, if you're in a car accident and you go forward and hit the steering wheel with your forehead, that is a really, really quick stop and is a big force on your forehead. What happens with an airbag? is it by having it out there, it increases the time it takes for you to stop, and therefore decreases the force. And you're doing the same thing with the egg. So what you need to do is you need to find an egg and find whatever you want to wrap it around where you can make, you can try and get it to not break, but also using the least amount of material. And my challenge to you is this, that you have somebody in your family compete with you against that. 
because first of all, competition makes everything more fun. Second of all, you have a leg up on them because you know a little bit about what we're talking about here. And third of all, we're all kind of stuck right now being at home. So do something, tell your family you're going to have a contest and see who can do it. The way you'll get credit for this is by showing me what you got, showing me the toss, and showing me that it's not broken. If it breaks, show me that it breaks. That's fine. You don't have to keep doing it until it doesn't break. If you have family members do it, I'll mark that and keep it away. So if there's some situation where it's like, you know, you needed another point or two, um, that will come into play later. So you won't get any like, formal credit on it but it will definitely if you're if you're in a it's just one of those things to pocket away just in, just in case you might need um, something later so convince your family that they should do this with you have fun building it and uh and that'll be it so do you guys have any questions before we wrap up uh when is the lab due it'll be due next thursday both of these things are due next thursday when you take the quiz However, I would absolutely suggest that you get them taken care of this week because you will have another set of practice problems and another lab for next week. Any other questions that would benefit the whole? Uh, All right. yeah. For the question part for number one, would it be the mouse moving has more inertia? Yep, because, because it's the... Yep, because it is actually moving. The elephant is not. Yeah. Or no, the, the sorry, the mouse moving would have more momentum. Yeah. Because it is actually moving. Yeah. Mom momentum is just uh, inertia, right? That's. Um... It's moving inertia. So anything with mass has inertia. And the more mass you have, the more inertia you have. However, okay. in order to have momentum, it has to be moving. So if something is small and moving it will have more momentum than something that is large and stationary okay yeah and that's what that question's getting at there anything else all right i'll hang on for another moment or two if there's any other questions other than that have an excellent weekend give some turkey high fives Get your family to do an egg drop with you, and I hope you win. Um, and then, uh, and then we'll see you next week. Thanks.